Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm super happy to have Lisa Kaltenager with us and Ryan McDonald with us. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Thanks for Hello having there. us. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. It's a great, great article. I'm glad we're going to talk about it. What is your, uh, what is your geolocation? Where are you at? So I'm at uh, Ithaca, so Cornell University, and I am downtown right now, as most of you probably, working from home and experiencing the pleasures of the home office and trying to actually put a work-life balance in there with a six-year-old running around in the background. Mm, okay. Mine is a bit older. Mine is now 18. Uh, so she was supposed to go off to college this year. Um, so she did go to college, but uh, the whole dorm thing didn't happen. So. So my launch pad um, is not quite empty yet. <laughs> but the good thing is like you're not an empty nester. It's nice, you know, an additional year. That's a whole additional year. All right. And where are you at, Ryan? Uh, I am also in Ithaca in upstate New York, just uh, waiting and bracing for the snow to hit probably uh, in the next few weeks or month or so, and then I'll never be able to leave the house ever again. <laughs> so you've got the, uh, you've got the whole leaf color change things going in the in the east oh yes uh Gorgeous. overnight it seemed okay yeah so right now we can't complain too much because we have all these big outdoor places you know it's itaka it's gorgeous we have like lots of waterfalls downtown and so you have a lot of places to go and as ryan was just saying Currently, we have this beautiful colors of all the leaves. And then, in probably not too long, we're just going to sledge through the snow around here. Sleds, snowmen, you know, winter wonderland. Exactly. Winter wonderland. Cool. Uh, so, what do you like to do for research, Lisa and Ryan? What's your general interest? So here at Cornell, I founded the Carl Sagan Institute to build the forensic toolkit cool. to uh, find life in the universe, in the solar system and outside, all of course based on Carl Sagan having been here and already combined planetary and astro and bio. And so now we gave it uh, a real institute where people from more than 15 departments try uh, to actually figure out how we can find life in the universe and just have a lot of really interesting discussions because everybody has their own point of view. And so that's what I do. And my special research of my team alone is basically trying to figure out what we should look for. So how do signs of life change, for example, through the geological history of the Earth? What can you look at if you have the infrared wavelengths, the visible wavelength, the near infrared, if the planet transits, if you see it like a pale blue dot? So all of this mashed together. And what about if life is a little bit different from what we usually see around us? So all of that creating basically a database of spectral fingerprints okay. for planets that could host life and how we could find it. Cool. Cool. Brian, what do you like to do for in general? Well, so I'm interested in what the atmospheres of exoplanets are actually made of, what their, their physical properties are. So what the, uh, the temperature of the planet is, what its chemistry is, uh, what the clouds are doing, just what these distant worlds are actually like. Uh, so I, I kind of straddle the boundary between theory and observations. So I create theoretical models of the spectra, mainly of giant planets, uh, since that's what we currently have observations of with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance. And then I create frameworks to invert the observations from these telescopes to then tell us what the atmospheres are made of. So it's mainly hot Jupiters that I've worked on to date, since we have a pretty good spectra of them. But we're increasingly starting to move down the mass range into the... Um, more temperate and potentially terrestrial regime that uh, Lisa mainly works on. So the observations are just starting to catch up with the theory of the rocky planets. Cool. So how did you two uh, team up on this article we're going to talk about? Well, you know, as always, everywhere you are, the most interesting place <laughs> in an institute probably is at the coffee machine. And so Ryan and I just happen to like coffee. And so he's on the other side of the corridor and I'm on this side of the corridor. It's like there's a there's a there's a big U. And so we usually meet over coffee when we're like, oh let's have a cup of coffee. And then 
we chatted about, oh, you know, it's like, I'm, you're not allowed to know this, right? So Ryan is very good at keeping secrets. So I said, you're not allowed to know that because I was on the, a co-author on, or I am one of the co-authors on the discovery of the giant planet around the white dwarf. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we found that, I was like, oh my God, if they're like giant planets, there might be small ones. And I was like, I wonder what JWST could do with that. And so Ryan is an expert of actually trying to figure out what spacecrafts, whether it's Hubble or what the JWST can do. And so when he passed by for coffee, I was like, Ryan, you're not allowed to know about this, but what about if we found a giant planet around a white dwarf and imagine that could be a rocky one? What could we do? Cool. Yes, yeah, so the, the incredibly exciting and enticing idea behind that is, so when, when we think about uh, giant planets passing in front of a star transiting, uh, usually about 1% of the light from its star is blocked. And then a tiny fraction of that 1% is what goes through the atmosphere. But white dwarfs are just so absolutely tiny in comparison that this, this giant planet that Lisa mentioned, uh, WD 1856b, which was um, announced uh, back in uh, September as the first um, giant planet found transiting a white dwarf. Not, this, this didn't block out 1% of the light from its star. It blocked out something like 55% of the light from its star. Um, and that also means that a huge amount of the light goes through the atmosphere. And um, so one of the problems that we have as a field when thinking about rocky planet atmospheres mm -hmm. is that if it's hard to characterize giant planets, it will be even harder for rocky planets because the atmospheres are about, what, 60 times smaller for the Earth versus a hot Jupiter. Um, but if we were to have a rocky planet around a white dwarf, this is what we would see. This is all to scale here. The, the Earth would block half of the light from a white dwarf if it was orbiting it. And that means that the, the atmospheric signal would be incredibly, incredibly strong. Um, so we kind of understood this qualitatively, but what we uh, were interested in getting started with was, okay, so we know the signal theoretically should be strong, but white dwarfs are also really dim and so it, we also wouldn't be get collecting as many photons with our telescope. So the question was, um, what is the relative balance between these factors? Mm -hmm. Does the size of the planet overwhelm the fact that its uh, host is much dimmer? And that, that was where the idea kind of emerged to look at the possibilities with the James Webb Space Telescope of whether it would be, uh, compared to other potential targets, whether it would be better or worse to look at white dwarf planets. Cool. And that is going to lead us to this really awesome article. <clears throat> the White Dwarf Opportunity, Robust Detections of Molecules in Earth-like Exoplanet Atmospheres with the James Webb Space Telescope. And Lisa and Ryan, take us away. So where that came from and why it's really, really interesting, I think, in addition to there being a whooping signal, as uh, Ryan just mentioned, is this whole idea whether or not there could even be life on uh, a star that actually went through its whole main sequence and then has this exposed stellar core, a white dwarf left. And so initially, when they found the pulsar planets, right, in 1992, people were having this question about whether there could be life there. But for the pulsar planets, ooh, it kind of seems like a very, very harsh radiation environment. So these white dwarfs, where another idea of where planets could be. And so we have some other play, uh, papers with my uh, PhD students, Thea Kutsakis, who is the third author on this paper, where we basically explored the idea if there were a rocky planet around a white dwarf, would there be, and then let's assume there's life on it, would we be able to see it? Would it actually make a discernible difference in the spectrum? And so this is the theoretical background that we had before they found, and I'm very indebted to Andrew and the test team to actually find the first planet around a white dwarf. What's possible? Andrew Vandenberg is the first author on that planet around the white dwarf that Ryan just talked about. And so now these pieces fell into place. So we are not saying at all that there could be life on planets around white dwarfs. We're just asking the question, if there were, A, would there be signatures that you could look for? 
and B, what would be our best uh, means to find it, which telescopes, and so we identified James Webb as being capable to actually find these signatures if they're out there. And of course, the incredible philosophical implication is, can life, can the tenacity of life actually stretch beyond the death of its star? I'd like to add something about uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the title, the title actually. So um, it's a bit of a word play on an idea that's been going around in the expat community for over a decade now, in that um, it was recognized a long time ago that uh, M dwarf stars could be fantastic targets for characterizing exoplanet atmospheres. And that was called the, the M star opportunity. And um, so the fact that we were using the same kind of idea, but shrinking, so an M star is 10 times smaller than the sun. What if we shrink an M star, another factor of 10 times smaller? Okay. And so that's kind of where the, the title came from. Cool. Okay. And I think one of the things that also tells you, you should really work with somebody who happens to be British and has a beautiful world play capability and to get the perfect title. Oh yeah, we have a lot of fun playing around with uh, titles and trying to make sure that it's a, it's a pleasure to read the paper as well. <laughs> That's what we'll probably see when we get towards the end. Um, so uh, I don't know, uh, Lisa, perhaps, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the, the habitable zones of planets around white dwarfs? So basically what we were uh, finding in this earlier work with Thea is that um, you'd think maybe that, oh, okay, so the star is now dead. It's cooling down. First, it's like super hot because it's the, of course, the core, the remnant of a star, but it cools down gradually. So initially, it's a super hot environment. But once it's cooled down to about 6,000 degrees, so between 6,000 and 4,000 degrees, you actually get several billion years of a stable, nice environment where if the planet is at right distance, it sits there in the habitable zone for a couple of billions of years. Mm -hmm. What is a great opportunity? Again, we don't know if life can uh, survive. Maybe it can start again, who knows, uh, if the planet sits at right distance. And what's really, really interesting too is now in this other paper that Andrew led and Renderberg led about the giant planet, they tried to figure out how it could actually get there, right? Because it can't sit there and survive. And so the same would hold true for a rocky planet. And so you probably can actually get around this incredibly hot initial environment of a white dwarf by migrating this rocky planet in later. And so then it would sit there at the right distance, hopefully, off a slowly cooling white dwarf because the cooler it gets, the slower it cools. And the interesting thing here is it's actually completely the reverse of what we have, right? The sun is actually slightly increasing in luminosity. So our habitable sound in the solar system slightly moves out with time. And at one point we'll actually hit Jupiter and Saturn in a couple of billion years, so no worries yet. But here you have the difference. So you have a habitable zone that actually becomes closer and closer and closer to a cooling off white dwarf. So in a way, you might want to pollute your atmosphere as much as humanly possible to stay warm on an evolved planet around a white dwarf. That's kind of another interesting twist on this. But the habitable zone is pretty stable, or the white dwarf habitable zone can be, for a certain distance, a couple of billions of years long. And, you know, we think we needed about the less than 1 billion years on the Earth to get life started. So it might survive or it might get started again. Yep. Okay. Could we scroll down to figure one to illustrate uh, some of what we're talking about next? So the, the one thing I would add to what Lisa was just saying is that, so these, these transits occur incredibly frequently as well, because the, the semi-major axis is only around... Um, uh, what 0 0.01 AU or so. Right. So it means that um, it's about a 10 hour orbital period for mm -hmm. the planet. And then the transit lasts two minutes. So these are like very frequent events that just half of the, the white dwarf would just wink out every 10 hours. So that they're very, you can almost imagine seeing them like with your eye at like that level of um, flux decrease. 
So what we're showing in this figure on the left is a scale uh, diagram of um, what you would see if you had the Earth transiting um, the same white dwarf that um, Andrew Vandenberg uh, found a giant planet around, which was, um, we chose that as our case study. It's worth mentioning as well that this isn't one of the, the nearer white dwarfs. Uh, this is more, um, I mean, oh, ah, I always forget the, the orbital, where are we, 25 parsecs or so, was it? Um, so there are targets that are would be nearer and brighter. So this is kind of an intermediate uh, target to choose. Mm -hmm. On the right there, we have a, a model which we produced of the, um, the transmission spectrum of the planet. So what we mean by that is the uh, the fraction of the, the flux from the white dwarf that is absorbed as a function of wavelength. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's roughly 50% on average, but then there are large variations at the like 0.1% level due to the different molecules in the atmosphere. It's like that huge bump at the low wavelengths is ozone, then there's a spike due to O2. And then when you get into the infrared, then you have molecules like water, methane, CO2, etc. And that's what all these kind of wiggles are here. And then maybe if we zoom in a little bit further, just so we can see the, the there are actually two types of error bars on this figure kind of shown by stars and these circles. Yeah. These are simulated James Webb observations for if you were to stack 10 transit observations mm -hmm. and 50 shown by the circles and the stars. This is just to illustrate by eye that the, the scatter in the observations is um, a fair amount less than the kind of typical signal of these features to kind of qualitatively show that, uh, hey, James Webb should in principle be able to detect these species. Mm -hmm. And then we go on and quantify it later in the paper. And so what Ryan just mentioned about this really short duration, this is also why we think like with surveys from the ground, it's been so hard. It would be so hard to find rocky planets around these because the frequency you need, it's just like of observations, it's just so high. And so TESS with its uh, normal 30 minutes cadence, mm -hmm. or now with a lot of 20 seconds cadence, this is now in cycle four that you can propose to, right? January is like the guest observer program. Uh, I'm part of the test missions, you know, so science team mission, so, you know, it's just grain of salt. But there's lots of great things you can do with this 20 second cadence. And one of them is actually trying to find these rocky planets and have more than one point yeah. during the transit because the transit is so short. It's just a couple of minutes, maybe one or two, right? And so you need this cadence. And so by having uh, very frequent observations, you can find smaller and smaller objects. What's yeah. really interesting is that for some of the observations we had with tests, you would have found uh, some inkling of rocky planets as well, but you would have had to actually look at the same at the right time. And what you need to do, and we're working, or people working on a pipeline with the data is that because the transits are so huge around a white dwarf, the pipeline automatically throws it up. So they are now adjusting that. But so you have to actually go by eyes through this to find planets around a white dwarf because the signal is just whooping. Right. OK. Got it. And it's also very quick just to catch these transit events because there, there are two transits a day given the orbital period. So you can just go back, look, get another transit, and you can just stack them so quickly. So 10 transits, you know, you can get that in, in a week easily. Um, for, for other fortuitous targets, like a, let's say a planet in the habitable zone of an M star, then you've got to wait a week for, for every transit or so. So it just take it's so quick, theoretically, if the if these planets exist, we, we don't know yet. And as Lisa said, hopefully, hopefully Tess will find them if they're there. But in principle, it will be very quick to gather a very large number of uh, a very large number of transits for such planets. Nice. Very nice. Cool. So yeah, should we scroll on to the next figure, I think? So the, the next figure is similar to the first figure. Um, and, uh, maybe the, the easiest thing is to, because we were just talking before about the different chemicals, right? So the next figure actually shows you where they are. Exactly. So you just go a little bit further because it's, if you're not used to actually working with, uh, with spectra of rocky planets, it's very hard to figure out where these things are. 
And so when you go from left to right, so from shorter wavelengths to longer wavelengths, as Ryan was talking before, you would see like some small O3 feature, then you have O2 at 0.7. You see a couple of water features intermingled here, right? So water, water, water. And you see a quite whooping CO2 feature, one around 4.3 microns, just a huge spike out. And then you have some other CO2 features around 2.6 microns, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of this is with Ryan folded in to see how long you would actually, how many transits you would need to have with JWST to be able to retrieve them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and it's also worth mentioning out that kind of so the, the narrative that people usually think about for James Webb is that we can do rocky planets, but it's going to be hard. It is going to take a lot of observing time. Things like that huge CO2 feature at 4.3 microns will be the very first thing that you would see. And that would then at least tell you, uh, do we actually have an atmosphere around this planet or is it a stripped ball of rock or is it dominated by clouds? So the CO2 spike will be the first clue that you at least have a terrestrial atmosphere. And then you would push down the noise by stacking more and more transits. And then things like H2O would start sticking out. And so pe people think, yeah, we can definitely do CO2. We can do H2O. Maybe we can do methane, CH4. But detecting any of these potential biosignature molecules, so things like ozone in combination with nitrous oxide, N2O, mm -hmm. you can see these features are much, they're much weaker. So we were especially interested in how many transits you would need to um, push down to the biosignatures, which would be an incredible science case for James Webb. So, and, so uh, yeah. and so basically, as Ryan was just saying, if you take our own planet, and try to figure out what indicates life on it. It's a combination of oxygen with a reducing gas like methane, or Ryan was mentioning the other option of N2O. And so that's really in a way, I would say holy grail, but that's really what we're trying to find around these planets to then say, okay, we have no other uh, option or explanation for it except for life if it's not super hot and you split water to have a lot of oxygen, right? So that's basically the background. So you know where, how far away the planet is from the star and can like first order figure out what its temperature should be. Again, lots of depends on the atmosphere, but the CO2 spike will tell you or give you a, a hint of how much CO2 is in there because these CO2 lines become stronger and stronger with more CO2 in the atmosphere. So you can have a bracket on the greenhouse gases, especially if you then get a bracket on CH4 and water, which is a greenhouse gas as well, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, really interesting that this different chemistry that fits within the JWST window off observations and as Ryan said, you can get out the first ones with a couple of transits like CO2, actually start to give you a deeper insight in the environment of what's going on on that planet. And then a second step actually makes it, if such planets exist, right, we don't know yet. And if there could be life on such planets, we don't know that either, but it would become actually detectable with the James Webb Space Telescope assuming it's similar to the earth in terms of composition and outgassing in just a couple of weeks, what is incredible in terms of an opportunity. Again, we don't know if this planets exist. We do not know if there can be life on those, uh, whether it's initial or whether it's secondary, uh, but we'd have the capability to finding the signs if they're there. Cool. And, and let me ask imagine, a, oh, yeah. sorry, do, do go ahead. Let me ask a question on the right hand side axis that I assume that's scale height of the atmosphere. And so zero is the surface of the planet. Yep, that is correct. Okay. And so CO2 is well mixed throughout the atmosphere, right? Is that what that means? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, scale height is just the, the E folding height. So yeah, E to the minus five um, for the pressure above the surface. Okay. Incidentally, the reason you can't see all the way down to zero is that there's actually a, a, a refractive surface um in the lower part of the atmosphere which limits how far you can probe down yeah. um i did just want to add for comparison that the wavelength range that we can probe with reasonable precision with hubble at the moment 
is from about 1.1 to 1.6 microns. So it's a tiny fraction of this, but you see those two spikes of water? Those are basically uh, what we tend to see in most exoplanets, like hot Jupiters that we look at. Okay. So that you can see from the greater wavelength range here, or for, and from all the, this is why we chose different colors as well for the different molecules, that there's a huge increase in the chemical diversity that we'll be able to uh, be unearthed yeah. once we switch out to James Webb. Awesome. Very cool. So, and one of the things that is interesting, sorry, just because Ryan mentioned it. So um, the question is how, how deep you can probe an atmosphere for transiting planet actually has a lot to do with uh, how far away it is from the star or the stellar remnant in this case, and the atmospheric composition, because the light that comes out to hit you as an observer needs to be parallel rays. And so the question is like, do you have light that comes in under an angle steep enough that when it comes out, it's a parallel ray? And this is what sets this refraction limit for all transiting planets. And we found that for M stars, it goes further and further down. And so for white dwarfs, it's actually not that bad at all, right? It's just like a little bit above the zero, but uh, it's interesting because for example, for F stars, for hot F stars, it's a lot for Earth-like planets. And it'd be like about 15 kilometers, 16 kilometers. Right. So you start to losing all the water features mm -hmm. because water is well mixed on the Earth under 12 kilometers. So the star actually has a big influence on how far you can probe down for uh, a rocky planet around it in the habitable zone. Different paper, but just because Ryan mentioned it. All good, cool. Okay, so the core of what we did, um, so if we just stay on this figure just for a moment before, I mean, the next figure is the best one, but I just need to find a little bit of context before showing the kind of big result. Yep. So you see the simulated uh, JWST observations on this plot, for example. So we used a JWST noise simulator to simulate um, everything from one transit up to 100 transits with um, one of the instruments on James Webb, the NERSPEC PRISM. And then we pretended that this was a set of real observations that we had obtained from James Webb and making zero assumptions about the atmosphere besides the fact that we knew the radius of the planet and the mass from some kind of previous observations. Taking the observations, we then ran it through what we call a, uh, an atmospheric retrieval code, which is what we use to detect things in the atmospheres of real planets with Hubble, for example. It's basically just a, um, a Bayesian fitting tool that maps out a parameter space to explore what the composition and the temperature and other properties must be to explain a given spectrum. And so the output from that is that we get statistical constraints on the model parameters, which can explain the observations. So in this case, a constraint on, say, how much water there is in the atmosphere. And we also get, via Bayesian model comparisons, detection significances for each of the species in the atmosphere. And that is what is shown in the next figure, which if there's any one thing to take away from our paper, it is figure three. So here is um, on the y-axis, it's the detection significance that we predict as a function of the number of transits. And um, although obviously in, in astronomy, we're often very happy if we get a three sigma signal, if you want to make a, a big claim like biosignatures, you're probably going to want to be at least in the five sigma territory. Yep. So we see that water in CO2 by the time you're at five transits, you're already in the secure conclusive detection territory. But the thing that really blew us away is that if you go up to 25 transits, then we have ozone, the, um, uh, the brown curve, and methane, the purple curve, both enter the five sigma regime. And 25 transits, it's so quick to observe when you have two transits a day so you're talking what, like a two week observing campaign mm -hmm. to get five sigma detections of this one potential biosignature pair. And this is the result that really blew us away when we, we first got those simulations. 
And actually, one of the things that was really funny is like, we saw this results. I'm like, oh my God, we have to put in a JWST proposal. And I'm like, oh yeah, we don't have a planet yet. <laughs> but really, this, this would be really, what's really funny we because Ryan was like, um, we, we don't have one. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're waiting oh. for, for, the, uh, for a test to find one of those. But just to mention, you know, we actually, this is, this is kind of conservative if you want, because we are using a modern earth model. So if you would go a little bit back in time, even mm -hmm. so the oxygen and the ozone goes down a little, methane would go up. So you would actually have more methane. And so you would find this methane levels much faster. And so this is just for a modern earth analog, but uh, these are, if it's out there, this is definitely within the possibility of doing what's kind of an amazing uh, an amazing answer. So when Ryan brought this plot, you know, I was like, oh my God, this is exciting. We have to propose. And then we're like, okay, we don't have a planet yet. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> right. <funny>. Oh yeah. <laughs> the saga I have to deal with is like half the halfway between observing and theory, <laughs> like yeah, connecting exactly. both communities. But this is the funny thing when you work on a paper like fully in, I'm sure that lots of people can uh, relate to that. You like it it becomes real, right? To the point where you're like, oh, uh -huh. we should really not forget to do this. Absolutely. Fair enough. So, what one thing I'll add to this to this uh, figure here is that when we do first, even if we have a five sigma detection of ozone and methane, the interpretation of that as a biosignature will still be questioned, and 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 rightly so. If you're making a big claim that you might have a biosignature on a planet outside the solar system, you want to make sure that you have some kind of independent lines of evidence that back this up. We won't talk about so. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're seeing that a little bit with uh, well, Venus at the back moment back. as well. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> so, so yes. Um, Talk about our paper, Ryan. Talk about yeah, our yeah, paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, this one. So, another potential biosignature that has been proposed is uh, nitrous oxide um, plus ozone. Okay. Okay. And we see here that you just need to double the number of transits and N2O pops out as well. Yep. So, you can make a testable prediction once you have one biosignature that you should see a second one. And if you go even further, you can even detect molecular oxygen and uh, N2, which can also have biological interpretations. Right. So this is just demonstrating that there's a clear progression here. You would do a quick reconnaissance program to see if you have water and CO2. Mm -hmm. If you find it, then you can propose for more time to push into the biosignature regime and then if you really think you've got a planet that might have life, then you know that you can learn even more with just a little bit more observing time invested. I suspect that a, a serendipitous or otherwise detection of these two would make for a very compelling JWST proposal to do these. <laughs> right? yeah. That's also why we gave on the top axis the, the amount of time with mm -hmm. James Webb. Mm -hmm. already sorted into the categories of exactly what people would need to know if they wanted to write a proposal for such a planet. If they did. So, uh, yeah, if hypothetically a planet exists and they wanted to do it, then we try to make it as easy as, easy as possible. And uh, so, yeah, uh, let's hope we find one of these planets because the prospects are extraordinary. Absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. Nice work. Nice work. And then we have one more figure, uh, which is just the predicted constraints on the composition of the atmosphere for a small, medium and large James Webb program. Yeah, okay. And this is just demonstrating that, you know, everything becomes tighter as you might expect. However, we do find that it's really hard to detect um, oxygen and nitrogen because they, they don't have um, as many prominent spectral features as the other molecules. Yeah. So you really have to beat down the error bars to be able to detect O2. And the second you detect O2, then the Bayesian framework can tell that, oh, the atmosphere is not mostly N2, which is a similar uh, mean molecular weight to O2. And then it can correctly tell that there is 21% O2 and 78% N2. Um, but yeah. you still get all the other components out correctly, even when the retrieval code quite, can't quite tell what the N2 to O2 ratio is for the smaller programs. Yeah. 
And what I really like about the progression that Ryan was just talking about is that progression is not unique to the white dwarf planets, right? That's probably what we're going to do with any planets where we could find signs of interesting atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just for this white dwarf planets, it's just so much faster because you get two transits a day, right? For everything else, you basically expand the observation timeline according to how long the planet actually needs to go around the star. But I think what was really nice that we could, because it's so fast, show this beautiful progression in the last figure. And this now tells you what that constrains. Because once you have enough data on different molecules in an atmosphere, then you actually start to be able to back out a lot of information about a planet without, as Brian was saying first, we, we, we tried to retrieve this without any idea of what the atmosphere was like, just assuming that this was the spectrum we got. And so I think that's definitely what we're going to try to do for all the other planets too. Uh, hopefully we find lots of them and hopefully we're going to have way too many. But uh, this is a progression we want to do with any planets that could show interesting signs and then signs of life, more information. And this white dwarf opportunity just basically offers itself because the time to do these steps are kind of very reasonable compared to you'll need years to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning as well that because the time is so short, imagine we don't get lucky. Imagine the frequency of true Earth analogs is so low uh, mm -hmm. that maybe you have to look at 10, 10 planets that at least from physical properties look promising before you find one which even has an atmosphere. Um, the fact that it's so quick to do a quick survey and see if the planet is interesting means we will be able to survey more rocky planets with James Webb than we would be able to if you had to put in, say, a year of observations to know if the planet was promising or not. Right. Right. Very cool. And so as we, I think as we said before, the interesting thing now is that we have tests uh, up uh, that can you might know, like perfectly search for these kind of transits. And so hopefully uh, we'll hear soon that they found them. And so uh, then we can uh, try this out, right? So this is basically what Ryan was just saying. And as we were talking about before, these are not the closest ones, right? So the one that we actually made this model for is hopefully a very conservative approach because it's actually quite pretty far away. So when you see here, thanks for putting it up. So you see that this is actually quite a far away uh, uh, 24 parsecs, right? 24.7 parsecs away white dwarf. There's a lot of them much closer than this. Right. And so hopefully if we're lucky and uh, there's a planet around the closer ones that will be rocky, then these numbers actually tumble down to much less and so we can find way better constraints in a much shorter time scale. But we uh, focused on this one because we know it has a giant planet. So we're saying, okay, let's not be the most optimistic person and say the next closest white dwarf, you know, at 6.4 parsecs has a rocky planet because that's probably, you know, hopefully does, but probably a little bit uh, optimistic thinking. But even at 24 parsecs, yeah. it's only a couple of uh, transits that you need for the first exploration. And that's what makes it so compelling. Cool. Cool. All right. So, so yeah, I think that because uh, the only other point that I would mention, which is in the section 5.3 uh, there, is that although we did this for James Webb, there is a lot of potential for ground based observatories to also contribute to such studies, whether it be searching explicitly for these planets by looking for these 50% transit events or for obtaining spectroscopy of the planets. Uh, James Webb, it's very expensive to point James Webb at a target. So you can't just point James Webb at one of these white dwarfs, get the two minute transit and then look at another object. You have to point it then wait an hour for it to stabilize. So it uses up a lot of time to do this. If you had a ground based telescope that could literally just turn, look, snap, 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 turn away, do something else it would then be very, very quick for a ground-based observatory to obtain some quite high quality spectra of one of these planets. Nice. Any chance for citizen science in that? Oh, I, I don't know, actually. Um, I'm sure there would be prospects. Oh, no. um, I, I think know that that's a good idea. I think especially the search, right? 
So if this is this yeah. is such a whooping signal of these planets around the white dwarf. So if there were, you know, there's so many great, uh, so there's two parts, right? There's so great, so many great amateur astronomers who could do this and help depending on their telescope size. But I am also sure, you know, with tests, we have a lot of citizen science projects going on. The test data is public. So if you want to find these, as I said, unfortunately right now you have to go go through it by hand because the pipeline doesn't catch it yet because the, the transits are just too deep. Right. But um, absolutely, there's a lot of great ideas. I think people are just catching up <laughs> on trying to actually propose what people could do with this because the first uh, discovery of a giant planet around the white dwarf was just announced in September. Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth mentioning that since September as well, there's been about, what, four papers have gone up on archive trying to explain how this planet formed or migrated to where it is. Like, yeah. people are... Ser there's a serious upsurge in activity in the concept of white dwarf planets. And if that's what's happening just from the first one that we found, th this would really take the community in exoplanets by storm if we can find any, it doesn't even have to be a habitable planet, but any kind of rocky planet around a white dwarf, Right. Um, the prospects will be phenomenal and our field will grow a lot from it. Okay. And I think what's, what's also really interesting, right, what Ryan just touched on is what are these rocky worlds like? You know, are they desiccated? Do they have water? Can they get water? Like all of these fundamental questions, what we showed is that water and CO2 are easy to find, even if it's not a, a, a habitable planet, right? So, so you could actually expect more water or more CO2, right? We just made one model. And so it will give us so much more information about this migration process then we have currently and hopefully that information we can fold in to the migration process of early planets around early stars that make habitable planets right just like another bridge back to where we're trying to figure out how the migration works for early solar systems or early planetary systems so i think because it's so easy to um to get information just because of the contrast between star size and planet size uh i think there's a lot of things we can learn not just about whether there is life on such rocky worlds, but just how this whole migration process, of course, after the, the death of a star works, but maybe it also can tell us something about what's going on, how much atmosphere you lose during that migration while there's like UV flares from the, uh, from the star or so. So I think it's just like other puzzle pieces that we can just build into other parts of the whole story of uh, planets and hopefully habitable worlds. I think the future is pretty bright for this topic, <clears throat> even though the oh, story yes. is dim. <laughs> Very cool. Lisa, Ryan, I want to thank you so much for sharing your, your article with us. Thank great. you so much for doing this. Thank I you love very it. much. I actually love that I can now just tune in and hear authors talk about their work because there's a lot of times that I feel that, oh, I really get the idea of the article, but for example, as you saw when Ryan was talking or when we were talking about these different figures, right? Yes, we tried to all spell it out in the paper, but it's really cool to hear people say, oh, and you should notice this. Oh, and you should. So I love that you have this thing where I can just basically tune in and hear authors talk about what I should actually focus on in that paper. I love this idea of this podcast. So thank you for doing this. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for doing it. Um, I think that's great. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into this edition and we'll see you on the next one. Bye. See you, everyone.